let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the Bible study today. We thank you because of the way your spirit has been so faithful, leading us to the depth of study of your word. Father, we thank you because you have not kept us in ignorance. We thank you because there is a desire within us wanting to come into the fullness of the light of the revelation of the word of God. We know that a person can only be as strong as is knowledgeable in the word of God. We know that when the Spirit of God reveals your truth unto us, it is so that we can become so strong and steadfast in our Christian lives. We realize that those who have shallow understanding of your word generally live shallow Christian lives. It is the death of study, the death of your revelation, the death of your interpretation, the death of the application of the word of God that actually come to strengthen us and come to make us the solid, steadfast Christians we ought to be. And therefore, Lord, we pray that as we come week after week, that your word will continually strengthen us in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you help us to see the wisdom of living these periods every week apart so that we can come together and get into the study of the word of God so that you will first of all do something wonderful within us that will lead us to helping other people too to be what they ought to be in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Today we come together to study your word and we plead with you, Lord, that as we look at these pages of the scripture, that you will speak to our hearts directly in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that like the sun will melt the ice. We pray, O oh Lord, that your word will come with the real heat and with the real power, the real light that will melt our hearts to submission in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, that the word we hear from day to day, from week to week, will do a great work supernaturally in every heart hearing in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that the people that also hear through the cassette, even many days or many weeks to come, will benefit tremendously from the teaching of the word of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. Be with us today as we study. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come together today to continue our study of the book of Exodus. Already the Lord has led us through chapters 1 to 6. And we now come to chapter 7. This seventh chapter of Exodus begins the second section to the book. In the first section, chapters 1 to 6, we saw the need of redemption, pictured by a people enslaved. In this second section, chapters 7 to 11, we're going to see the might or the power of the Redeemer displayed in the plagues on Egypt. If we look at the first section and the second section contrasting them, you will see this. In the first section, we had the description of the persecution and perplexity of Israel. In this section, we shall see the display of God's power over Egypt. First section, persecution and perplexity. In this second section, the power of God over Egypt. Again, in the first section, we saw the arrogance and rebellion of Pharaoh. In this section, we are going to see the agony and the humiliation of Pharaoh and Egypt. In the first section, we read of the weakness and discouragement and complaint of Moses. You remember that in many of those chapters that we read, as God gave him the call and God gave him the commission, he will complain he couldn't speak well. He would complain he was of uncircumcised leaves. He was not eloquent at all. The children of Israel had not listened to me. How will Pharaoh listen unto me? In that first section, you will have discovered the weakness, the faithlessness, we can say, and the discouragement and the complaint of Moses. In this section, you don't see anything like that. What do you see in this section we're going to look at? You see his authority, his courage, and his boldness. Also in the first section, Pharaoh challenged God's authority, saying, who is the Lord that I should hear his voice 
I do not know the Lord, neither will I let the children of Israel go. Here in this section, God acts in power and authority against Pharaoh and against all the gods of Egypt. So, in this chapter 7, we have a turning point, a marked change, a marked difference. Moses is no more timid, no more hesitant, no more discouraged. In fact, in this section we get into now, you will see the omnipotence of the Lord displayed in every event, in every action, in every scene. We're going to look at chapter 7, and as we look at chapter 7, we're going to divide into three parts. Point 1, Moses' exalted position above Pharaoh. Point 2, the hardened hearts of men. Point 3, miracle of judgment on Egypt. Let's look at point 1. Let's read our Bibles together. Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he sent the children, that he sent the children of Israel out of his land. Those verses introduce us to what we call a turning point in the mission and ministry of Moses. They now tell us the way God was going to be acting with Pharaoh. They now show, they show us very clearly and very pointedly the method and the means by which Moses will get Pharaoh eventually to yield to the will of God. Look at that in verse 1. The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. We need to thank God for his loving kindness. We need to thank God for his gentleness. We need to thank God for his patience. You see, Moses had complained so much. Moses had shown so much timidity and fear and weakness, discouragement, that God could have given up on him. With all the complaints of Moses that we have been reading from chapter 3 all through to chapter 6, we could have felt that God will choose another person to replace him. But no, it shows us of the grace of God, of the mercy of God, of the patience of God. Learn that for yourself too. You see, God has been patient with you. This is why we need to so thank God and we need to, thank, we need to so thank Him and give ourselves to Him. In complete, absolute surrender. And I'm sure God has been patient with me too. God has been patient with you. God has been patient with other people. Let's also learn another lesson. It may be that we see some people around us, those who are believers. And the Lord is calling them to a particular assignment. And because they sincerely feel they are weak, they sincerely feel they are not qualified, they sincerely feel that they really cannot do it. They bring up a lot of excuses, a lot of complaints, a lot of observations about themselves. As God has been patient with Moses, as God has been patient with you and with me, may we also be patient with these people also. May God help us not to take these people at their word and say, well, you say you are weak, then you are weak. You say you cannot do it, then you cannot do it. You say you are useless, then you are useless. God does not deal like that with us and we will be more patient with people, more kind with people, more gracious with people. And now God said, Moses, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh. We learn another lesson here. That he that humbles himself, God will exalt. Moses had humbled himself. I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. I am just a man of uncircumcised leaves. He didn't build up his image. He didn't say, yes, I can do it. I am the right caliber, the right instrument. I'm the one that can overpower Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out. He said, I can't do it. I am nothing. My words are not powerful. My words are impotent. It is this humble man that God picked up and God said, Moses, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. 
Moses was endowed with divine authority to act as God's ambassador. That is, from now on, God was telling Moses he will be acting in God's stead. He was to rule over Egypt, Egypt's proud king, commanding him to do what he should do. That is, he will be commanding Pharaoh, directing Pharaoh, and controlling him whenever he did wrong. He would also have the authority and the power to punish him for his disobedience so that eventually Pharaoh would have to plead with Moses that he will appeal to God to remove the plagues from the land of Egypt. This exalted position on the side of Moses involved arduous work and terrible responsibility. You see, when God put his ammunition, his arms, his power, his authority, his ability to work those wonderful, terrifying miracles in the land of Egypt, it was a great responsibility on the side of Moses. Let's understand, if God gives us his power, if God gives us his anointing, if God commissions us that we're going to do something marvelous like this in the nation or in the world, we should understand it's going to require hard work, hard doers work, and, and it's going to be terrible responsibility. And Moses was to be fully employed in communicating only the message of God, only the mind of God unto Pharaoh. Well, we need to notice another thing here. That were it not for the slavery of, Egypt, of um, Israel in Egypt, Moses would not have been a God unto Pharaoh. This exalted position was to be used only in seeking the freedom or deliverance of Israel. It was not for pride. It was not for personal profit. It was not for self-aggrandizement. That means that if God has made us to be, to be a leader in his church, let us understand, it's because there are sinners that are evangelists. If there were no sinner, God would not have raised up anyone to be an evangelist. Therefore, the primary purpose, the primary focus of an evangelist is to serve and to, and to draw sinners to the Lord. Now it is because there is a church. It is because there are people that need to learn, people that need care, people that need love, people that need fellowship. That's the reason there is a church. That's the reason there is a pastor. If there were no need of the people of God, there will be no need for a pastor. Also the same thing, if we have leaders in the church, it's because there are people to teach, people to instruct, people to serve, people to help, people to lead in the way of the Lord. If the needs were not there, there will be no need for leadership. What that means is this, we should always be conscious of the need, of the need in the leadership, so that we will know we are not there for pride, we are not there to build a self-image, we're not there to lord anything over anybody. We're there to seek the freedom and the deliverance of the people of God. To seek the victory over temptation. And to seek the victory, the triumph in life. So that the people will live victorious lives. They will not be slaves of sin. Slaves to the flesh and slaves to the devil. That's the reason God has appointed any of us leaders in the church of the living God. Go back to verse 1. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. You know the arrangement here, you remember in chapter 4. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 4. When Moses complained that he couldn't speak well, then God gave him Aaron to be his assistant, to be his mouthpiece. God said he will still communicate the word directly unto Moses. And then Moses will give all the word unto Aaron. In that capacity, Aaron will be acting as his prophet. Exodus chapter 4 from verse 14 to verse 16. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Verse 15. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth. 
and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and it shall be it, and it shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. If we compare those two references, that is Exodus chapter 7 and Exodus chapter 4, we learn of the ministry and the mission of a prophet. Look at that verse 15 again, that is in chapter 4. God said, Thou shalt speak unto him. That is all the word God will give unto Moses, all the words without taking anything away, Moses will give unto Aaron. And then put words in his mouth. That means Aaron, acting as a prophet unto Moses, will speak only the words that Moses will put in his mouth. And then God said, for Aaron to even be able to do that, and for Moses to be able to do that, they will need divine help, divine support. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth. Although Aaron was eloquent, he still will not be able to discharge the duty of a prophet except I be with his mouth, except I teach him. Even when he has received the word, he may understand the word, he may have got the fullness of the word, except I be with his mouth, he will not be able to give the word exactly as he should give it. Do we learn a lesson there? No matter how talented we are, no matter how fluent, how eloquent we are, no matter how intelligent we are, we will not be able to give the word as God has given the word, except God be with our mouth. How we should pray constantly. Even when we have studied the word, even when we have understood the word, even when we have prepared the outlines together, that God will be with our mouth. Because without that divine aid, that divine help, we will not be able to give out the word as God wants the word to be given out. Now we have learned the real meaning and definition of what constitutes a prophet. A prophet is God's spokesman. It's a person that acts, that he gives the word of God unto the people. Only the word of God, the Lord put in into his mouth the very words he would utter. This teaches us another lesson. That the people who are not speaking the word of God are not the prophets of God. You see, there are people today, they may, show, they may say they are prophets because they wear a kind of garment. Because they use a kind of band or belt. Because they do not wear shoes. Because they have a kind of special cap on their head. Because they carry a particular stick. Because they ring the bell, they burn the candle, they burn incense. Are these the real prophets of God? The answer is no. Why do we say the answer is no? Because the revelation they bring many times does not include the revelation of being born again. The revelation of holiness of life. The revelation of the written word of God. You see, if anybody rises up to say that he's a prophet, and he does not bring the total word of God, then we know that such an individual is a deceiver. He's not a true prophet. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. In verse 31, Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them, that prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err, to go astray, by their lies and by their lightness, yet I sent them not nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. You see, the people that bring any revelation, any vision, any trance, any dream, and these revelations and visions and dreams, they contradict the word of God. Those are not the prophets of God. That is why we should be very careful. We should not allow ourselves to be misled. We should not allow ourselves to be deceived. A prophet of God will speak the word of God. There's something we still need to notice. We shouldn't miss out in Exodus 
chapter 7, verse 2. Exodus chapter 7, verse 2. And thou shalt speak all that I command thee. And thou shalt speak all that I command thee. God's command to Moses was very definite. And that is what I've just read to you now. Thou shalt speak all that I shall command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh. Moses was not free to choose only a part of God's word which he judged most suitable for Pharaoh. You see, there, there are people who will look at others' facial expression, their countenance, or will notice their mood and their temper. And because of their mood and temper, which is not quite inviting, they will change the word. If they see that the word is not being accepted, if they see that the people are frowning, if they see that from the expression on the face of the people, they are rejecting the word, then they will recount, then they will, they will say, well, I didn't know that's the way they will react. They will not speak the totality of the word of God. But God said, don't look at his face. Don't look at his temper. Don't even listen to his utterances. Don't listen to his threats or threatenings. Just speak all that I shall command thee. Here is something that brings joy to our heart. Look at this. Because you see, all the people in Bible days, all those writers in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that is the commission God gave them, that they will speak, they will write, they will give out all that he has commanded. That's why we have joy. That we have the fullness of the Bible. That's why we have joy, that we have everything God intended for us to have. Because those people obeyed the Lord, they yielded and submitted to the divine inspiration of God. And they have preserved for us the word of God. But then the challenge comes to us today. They have given us the word, and we are now to give the word unto others. As Moses gave the word unto Aaron, and Aaron was not supposed to give the word unto Pharaoh and unto others. And neither Moses nor Pharaoh had any liberty to change what had been given. The same thing with us. We have no liberty to change what has been given. The same charges laid upon all preachers today that we are to speak and we are to declare everything as the Lord has given unto us in Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth a sign and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I have put my words in thy mouth. When the word has been put in your mouth, what do you do? Do you hide it, swallow it, keep it, so that nobody will hear? Verse 17. Thou therefore gather up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. Speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. It's the same commission, the same charge that New Testament believers have today. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, teaching them to observe. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end, unto the end of the world. So then, we are commanded to speak the word. The whole word, not part of the word. He has given us a charge. We should not withhold anything from the people of God, and even from the sinners to whom we have been sent. In Second Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Hold fast the form of sound words, sound doctrine, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So then, we should not be unfaithful. We should faithfully declare the word of God. Now we go to point two, Exodus chapter seven. And here is a place where you now have to really pay attention because this is very significant. 
Many people have misunderstood what we're going to read about now. And it is very necessary that you will look at the word of God and you will even pray quite clear as I, as I look at this with you. That God will grant you understanding. Chapter 7, I'm reading to you from verse 3. Exodus chapter 7 from verse 3 all through to verse 14. Open your Bible and be alert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was first called years old, and Aaron first called, and three years old, when they spake unto Pharaoh. And the Lord spake unto Moses and, Aaron, and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said, verse 14, unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Here we are reading about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And there are many people that have misunderstood this passage. And they have not fully considered all the information we have concerning the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Some people have said that God deliberately Hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that he will not hear, he will not listen. Others have said God purposely created Pharaoh so that he will become a rebellious fellow. He predestined him to be like that so that eventually his heart will be hardened and God will judge him and God will send him to hell. Those people who are saying that they have said that even if Pharaoh wanted to repent, he could not because God had willed and predestined and decreed that his heart will be hardened and therefore there was nothing that Pharaoh could do. I want to tell you that that is not right. That that is not the right interpretation of the word of God. And this is something that we need to take note of very well so that we will see what actually happened unto Pharaoh. And I also want to tell you that it wasn't only Pharaoh. There were other people in the Bible that had the same danger of having their hearts hardened. And even those of us who live today, you will see as I point scriptures to you, there is a danger that if we do not watch, our hearts too could be hardened. Now let us look at this passage that I've read. I want to point something significant to you to start with in verse 6. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so they did. So did they. Now you will see that these men of God are very careful in doing and saying only what God had appointed they will do and they will say. In verse 10, And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did as the Lord had commanded. They did as the Lord had commanded, and yet Pharaoh did not listen. Let us learn a lesson from that. You know, it is possible for you and for me to do exactly as the Lord 
as commanded. And all the people that see what we have done may not all be converted at that same time. You see, sometimes some people condemn themselves. They examine, it's good to examine ourselves, but it's not good to condemn ourselves unnecessarily. They say, all these people have not been converted. All these people have not surrendered. All these people have not yielded. Maybe it is because something is wrong with me that I don't know about. Well, there are times when maybe we have wrong method. There are times when maybe our message is incomplete. There are times when we are not prayerful enough. There are times when we have not projected the power of God. And we have not projected the personality of God the way we should. There are times when we have not been faithful to declaring the whole counsel of God. And when we find that in our lives, we need to go back to God and say, God, I know it's my fault. I repent in dust and ashes. But please understand, there are other times when we have been faithful. We have declared the word of God. We have done the work of God. We have faithfully carried out everything the Lord has commanded. And yet we may find that some people still had in their hearts. Some people refuse to repent. Some people refuse to yield. Let us also see something here. Now that Aaron and Moses were already old men. Moses in verse 7, 80 years of age. Aaron, 83 years of age. And yet God sent them unto Pharaoh. We learn here God can use the old and God can use the young. And we shouldn't think that because of our age now we have turned 60, we have turned 70 or 80. Because of that, we cannot hear the voice of God. Not only that, we as a church should be very, very observant and very careful of the spirit of the age. You see, in the, in the world, when you get to a particular age, past 55 or 60, you retire. And then they say that you have no use anymore, at least in that company. That you should leave the place and give chance to another person. But in the case of Moses and Aaron, 80 years of age, 83 years of age, God himself picked on them. And he said, the major part of the ministry I want, to carry you, uh, I want you to carry out, it is now. And we shouldn't look at people in our fellowship, in our church, who have become 60 or 65 or 70 or even more. And say, we have no place for you. We have no ministry for you. You can't do anything because of your age. Let us give the chance to only the young people. Let us make sure that we're learning from scripture. And let us give ourselves completely to the will of God. That whoever he wants to use, however young, however old, we are giving them the chance and the platform whereby they'll be able to fulfill the God-appointed and the God-given ministry. Now, in the case of Pharaoh, when he saw the miracle that he did, because God said he will say, show me a miracle for you, so that I will know that you are sent by God, as you claim to be sent, that Aaron and Moses will do. The miracle that God had put in their hand, they threw the rod down, it became a serpent. Then we are told that Pharaoh, also called his magicians and sorcerers, verse 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. They cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But we're told Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. That shows the supremacy of God. That God is greater in power. Those magicians lost their rods. But then it had something, an effect on Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought, well, Moses and Aaron did that. My magicians did that. What was the result? He hardened his heart. The miracles from Moses and Aaron did not convince or convict Pharaoh because he deluded himself, deceived himself by the lying wonders of the magicians. Miracles from God will not persuade wicked hearts who love unrighteousness, even if the dead be raised. That's what Jesus said, and he has told the story of the man who went to hell. The man said, said Lazarus, that he will go to my relatives and tell them, so that they will not come into a place like this. 
Abraham said, they have the word of God. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The man in hell said, no, nay, Lord, nay, my father, Abraham, that if somebody should arise from the dead, they will listen. Then Abraham said something very significant. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they do not listen to the word of God, neither will they be convinced if one should rise from the dead. Here we see it in the case of Pharaoh. Miracles were performed. It didn't convince him because there were counterfeit miracles, lying wonders from Satan's agents. These are the tendency of hardening the heart against the truth. That's exactly what it did in Pharaoh's heart. We should beware of supernatural manifestations that are not from the God of heaven. Because Satan is the prince of the power of the air, he has power to produce lying wonders. It is not everything that looks like the supernatural that is of God. So we must be very careful to try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Let's now consider the hardening of the heart in particular. We're told in verse 3, and I will harden thee, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. What this is saying is that I will permit the heart of Pharaoh to be hardened. Why do we say that? You see, the sun shining will melt the ice and harden the clay. The melting and the hardening depends on the nature of the substance within. We will say the sun melted the ice. Actually, what happened is that because of the nature, of, because of the substance of the ice, that's why the sun had that effect. We will say the sun hardened the clay. Actually, it is because of the type of substance in the clay that the clay was hardened. So let us understand that. Actually, what hardened the heart of Pharaoh? Contempt of God, covetousness, pride, delusion, self-deception, and interest of Egypt. See the interest they had in Egypt? It was a kind of national sin. If we allowed these, um, if we allowed these slaves to go, who will bring Ramses? Who will build Python? Who will bring this and build that for us? Because of the interest they had in the economy of Egypt in the progress of Egypt, in the physical state and the physical things of Egypt. That is why he felt he must keep all those people by all means. God did not force hardness of heart upon Pharaoh. God cannot and God does not force evil upon any man. It is love for sin and the deceitfulness of sin that lead, the heart, that lead to hardness of heart. If a man delights in doing evil, God can eventually leave him to his lust and withdraw the restraints of grace from him until his heart becomes insensitive and hard. In that case, we will say, God has permitted it. God has allowed it. God has not given, God has not uh, restrained him to the fullest. He has allowed him to go in his own way. And we should be very careful because, in fact, the Bible says so. Look at it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 10. And with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Listen to verse 12. It explains everything. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The people that had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, those are the people that eventually become hardened. So as we look at the hardness of heart of Pharaoh, you will see that it was a voluntary thing. He, res he, he got into that situation because he had something that he wanted to protect, something he wanted to keep because of that he neglected. 
everything the Lord wanted him to do, and his heart became hardened. So it wasn't God that forced him to be hardened. Hardness of heart is the result of conscious and obstinate resistance to the will of God. If you listen, for example, to the great truths of Scripture, preach week after week, and you still reject those great truths of Scripture, you will become gradually hardened. The preaching of the gospel that was meant to convict and melt you will be the occasion of hardening your heart, not because God hates you, no, never, but because you persistently reject the truth, as I said before, the sun, which melts the eyes, hardens the clay. The melting of the hardening depends on the nature of the substance within you. As all things work together for good to them that love God, so all things work together for the worst, to the rebellious and to the impenitent. Let's look at some scriptures. In 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6 verse 6. Wherefore then do ye harden your heart? As the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their heart. You hear that? You see here we are told the real practical side of it. In Exodus we are told God permitted his heart to be hardened. But actually in this passage it says, Wherefore then, do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 14. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 14. We're still talking about the hardening of the heart and the various things that may harden the heart of an individual. It says, Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. It says when you hear the word of God and you tremble. You hear the threats or the threatenings of the word of God, you tremble. You hear the warning of, ju of judgment and you tremble. It says you'll be a happy man. Your heart will remain soft. But then it says, But he that hardeneth his heart will fall into mischief. That means the person that will hear the word of God and will say, Well, if heaven is going to fall, it will not fall on me alone. Such language, such attitude, such carelessness, such response to the word of God, to the warning of God, will make the heart of a person to, to be hardened and it will fall eventually into mischief. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1, He that being often reproved, hardness a snake. Hardness a snake. It's a voluntary thing that the man, that the woman does. It shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. If you hear correction from the word of God, you hear the word of God as you convict you and melt you down. But then you deliberately shrug your shoulder, pull away the shoulder, Harding your neck, harding your heart, and say, No, I'm not going to yield. And you are procrastinating the day of your repentance, the day of your yielding and surrendering unto God. It says, Sudden destruction might eventually come. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63, and we're looking at verse 17. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways, and hardened our hearts from thy fear? I want you to listen to the language of these Israelites. O oh Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways? Does God ever make a person to deliberately go astray from the way of God? No, not at all. What is this saying? All they are saying is this. O oh Lord, why hast thou permitted us to go astray? When we were going astray and going the wrong direction, why didn't you do everything you possibly can, knocking us and piercing us and sending thunder and rain and fire upon us, terrifying us, so that we will not go astray? Why did you just allow us to go our own way? That is the free will of man. That is that man has a free will and in his own volition, because he's a free moral agent, 
God is not going to impose himself upon man. And God is not going to say, if you want to go astray, that by all means I will not allow you. Why hast thou allowed us to go astray and harden our hearts from thy fear? What that means is, why have you are watching us and you see that the way we were going were hardening our hearts. Why did you allow that to happen? Why didn't you do everything that had to be done so that our hearts will not be hardened? Let us take note and let us take warning that if you harden your heart, the Lord may lead you to the hardening of your heart. The Lord may lead you to the hardening of your neck. Look at 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17 from verse 12. For the served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this sin. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah. By all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Verse 14, notwithstanding, notwithstanding all the messages, notwithstanding all the prophets, notwithstanding the love of God for them, notwithstanding all the times that God sent to them, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. You see, it was a voluntary thing. They did it themselves. They hardened their neck. Look at the New Testament. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 5. Mark chapter 3 and in verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his son was restored whole as the other. The first thing that may uh, surprise you, but this is not uh, part of what we're studying now, it's that Jesus Christ looked on them with anger. Actually, there are three Greek words translated anger in the New Testament. One Greek word means a kind of violent temper that is boiling and stirring from within. Real anger. What we know as anger. Another word just means a kind of displeasure. A displeasure that these people have not done right. We, we know that they have not done right. And therefore you have the feeling that this is not right. The, it is a low kind of anger that is uh, being talked about here. This is not a violent thing. This is not a terrible temper. No, not at all. The Greek word used here is that Jesus Christ was grieved in his heart. It, Jesus Christ had this displeasure because he knew that they were thinking the wrong way. They were acting the wrong way. And of course, you know, we, we all should do that. You should not see evil and then accept evil and just overlook evil. No, there should be a kind of feeling within you, a kind of displeasure within you. Not that you are angry to defend yourself. You are, you are displeased because the people are going the way of error. Now, as I've cleared that, let's not look at the verse itself. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved, grieved in the heart for the hardness of their heart. He said unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. Now the problem here is that these uh, religious people were bound by tradition. Their tradition is that nothing should be done on the day, on the Sabbath day. And because Jesus Christ healed the man on the Sabbath day, they were not pleased at all. And Jesus was surprised, he was grieved, he was burdened. Because of the hardness of their heart. You know what we learned there? We learned that the tradition that a person has been exposed to in the denomination is coming from can harden his heart against the truth. A person has been in the tradition of infant baptism. And that infant baptism can so harden his heart against the truth that he now needs to repent. He now needs to give his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. A person has uh, you know, swallowed the tradition that when you take Holy Communion, that is the body of the Lord, and because of that, you are saved forever. And he doesn't understand that you need to repent. You need to be born again. 
need to confess your sins and believe on the Lord with a personal saving faith. And that tradition can so harden his heart against the truth of the gospel. A person has been told that his denomination is the only church acceptable to God. Even though there is no, there's no new birth, there's no regeneration, and there is no new life. And yet he had not heart against the truth because of the tradition of his fathers and the tradition of his religion. Let's be very careful that we're not hardening ourselves. Let's be very careful that if you had hardened your heart before, you change. Oh, you say, is it possible? Once a person has been hardened, is it possible ever to change? Oh, yes. Oh, I thought once a person has been hardened, it's hardened forever and ever. Look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at me. And he upbraided them, he rebuked them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. You see, this is applied to the disciples. God didn't harden the hearts of the disciples on their own. They found it difficult to believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they did not consider all the words that Jesus had spoken unto them. We see another reason why people's hearts are hardened. When people do not consider all the words that the Lord had spoken unto them, then all the things that the Lord is now speaking, they may not believe. The reality of the resurrection of Jesus, they may not believe. And because of that, it may be their hearts are hardened. But when Jesus rebuked them, they realized. And their hearts softened. And the hardness of heart cleared away. And then they now believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He recommissioned them. And they were the people that still were instrumental to the salvation of multitudes of people. If your hearts had been hardened, a change can still come upon you. If you will allow God to soften you, to convict you, and to bring you to your knees. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 from verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in, the, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. It says, harden not your heart. You hear the word of God today, harden not your heart. You read the word of God today, harden not your heart. Because you see, there are people who harden their hearts. In verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There are times you meet people, and you remind them of the word of God they had known before, but no, their hearts are hardened, because they have gone into the world. Because of the pleasures of sin. They say they do not believe again the judgments of God which they used to believe, which they used to preach. The deceitfulness of sin, the pleasures of sin have hardened them. We should pray for such people. We should not give up on such people because God can still make them to recover themselves from the error and the snare of the devil. Let's come back to Exodus chapter 7. We're now coming to point seven, the miracle of judgment on Egypt. Exodus chapter seven, from verse 14, all through to verse 25. We'll read and then we'll make explanation and we'll soon close so we can pray. Exodus chapter seven, from verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. The hardness of heart is that he did not obey God. He did not respond to God. He refused to do what God wanted him to do. When we refuse to do what God wants us to do, when we become adamant in the way of error in our disobedience, when we are consistently rebellious against the revealed will of God, my brother, my sister, it is the evidence of the hardening of the heart. Beware. Verse 15, get thee unto Pharaoh 
in the morning. Lo, he goeth unto out unto the water. And thou shalt stand by the river's brink. Against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Here is the mercy of God, still sending to the man. Hitherto you have not heard, but I come to you again, I bring the message again. Hitherto you have rebelled, but I bring the message again. Let us keep on bringing the message. Let us bring, keep on sowing the seed. Let us keep on declaring the truth of the word of God, even if people have rejected in the past. In verse 17, Thus says the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand, upon the waters that are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood, and the fish that is in the river shall die. And the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe the, to drink of the water of the river. Here God was announcing beforehand the judgment he was going to bring upon the land of Egypt. You see, God gave the warning before he brought the judgment. Pharaoh in his rebellion had said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? That's in chapter 5. He said, I know not the Lord, neither will I let the children of Israel go. Pharaoh and the Egyptians had contended against the true God. Their contention raised a lot of questions, such as, Is there really a God as Jehovah? He traced another question, If so, what is the extent of his power? And what, if any, are the obligations that all men owed to him, to God Jehovah? To prove his existence and power and to bring about the deliverance of his people, God now was going to send a series of judgments upon the wicked, idolatrous Egyptians. Now the first miracle of judgment that we read of here is the miracle of turning river Nile and all the water in Egypt into blood. Now notice, there are miracles of mercy and there are miracles of judgment. You find that all through the Bible. Miracles of mercy for the people that submit, for the people that yield, for the people that call upon the Lord, for the people that believe on the Lord, for the people that pray, for the people that stand upon the unchanging promises of God. Unfortunately, there are other kinds of miracles too. Miracles of judgment. When the flood of Noah came and swept all those people away, it was a miracle for such water to be able to come to cover all the face of the earth. But it was a miracle of judgment. When fire came down from heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, for fire to come down and come to a particular city and not affect other cities, and come to a particular place only on those people that were wicked, that was a miracle. But it was a miracle of judgment. And in these plagues, in these sufferings and the things, the supernatural things that happen, that water was turned into blood and other plagues that come, came upon Egypt, those were miracles. But they were miracles of judgment. You see, as the walls of Jericho fell down, that was a miracle. But it was a miracle of judgment for the people of Jericho that were living there because of their sin. And you see, for David to throw the stone, and it came on right on the head of Goliath. Don't you know that was a miracle? On the, on the side of the children of Israel, that was a miracle of mercy. On the side of the Philistines, it was a miracle of judgment. On and on we can go as we look at all the things in the, in the Bible. And as we come to the revelation, and we'll see the beers being poured out, and we'll see the miraculous, supernatural things that will, that will be happening to punish the people at the time of the great tribulation. Those will be miracles. What kind of miracles? Miracles of judgment. Egypt worshipped River Nile, among many other gods. The Lord directed his judgments against those gods of the Egyptians. First of all, to prove to Pharaoh and to all the Egyptians that the God of Israel was a true God. And secondly, that there is no other God 
there's no other God. The false judgment, a plague of turning water into blood, was announced before it took place so that none would have any doubt concerning the source of the miracle. God sent warning before sending the judgment. That's always the nature of God. Before the flood of Noah came, he sent warning unto the people. And then over and over the children of Israel, before they eventually went into captivity, God sent his prophets to give them warning. And the apostles in the New Testament, they were used of God to give warning unto the people in Jerusalem and the people of Israel. Before AD, before AD 70, before General Titus came to wipe them away. And today, God is sending his warnings to all the earth by his preachers, saying, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The Lord is sending his warnings. Let us take heed to his warning. Come back to Exodus chapter 7, from verse 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that they may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt both in the vessels of wood and in the vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod, and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of, the, of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the miracle of judgment came. And here was the miracle of judgment. Water was turned into blood. We're told that the Egyptians worship River Nile because their living depended upon its waters to regate the land. There were also very few roads and the Nile, that is River Nile, was the main highway. Canals were built for secondary thoroughfares. As the Egyptians also worshipped many animals, which they, did, which they would not eat, their main diet, meat diet, was mostly fish. When the water was turned to blood, the fish also died, and the, waters, the river's tank was River Nile their god. More powerful than the Lord? No, the Egyptians now realize. The Egyptians' God went down in humiliation. Before the stretch out rod of Moses, the waters were polluted and were unfit for use. And the fish died, depriving the Egyptians of their very important food. The only way of getting water now, fresh water to drink, during these seven days of the plague, was by digging holes beside the river. Did this a miracle of judgment change Pharaoh at all? No. Why? Well, because of the devil bringing up his own emissaries, his own servants, his own agents. Look at what happened. In verse 22, And the magicians of Egypt did so with the enchantment, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. He didn't set his heart to all that. Why? Because after all, his magicians had done the same thing. And all the Egyptians, verse 24, dig round about the river for water to drink. For they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the river. A question that somebody may ask is this. Since Moses and Aaron had turned all the water in the land of Egypt unto blood, where did the magicians get the water they turned into blood? You see it in verse 24. They had to dig around to get water to drink. And out of the water they got in digging holes around uh, the river bed. It is out of the water they got from those holes. They said, we can do that to you. We can turn water into blood to you. And through their enchantments and magic and sorcery, 
They turned the water into blood. They couldn't turn blood into water. They couldn't remove the problem. All they could do was to increase the problem. You see, Satan is a great deceiver of men. At this time, at that time and at this time as well, he still has his emissaries present to try to discredit the supernatural demonstration of the power of God. Sent to convince the people that the Lord was the only true God. The magicians of Egypt did a similar miracle with their enchantments. Now that the miracle of judgment had been duplicated by his own men, Pharaoh reasoned that there was nothing unusual in the demonstration of God's power. So the haughty, stubborn heart of Pharaoh was hardened. If the magicians had wanted to actually manifest their power, what should they have done? They should have removed the plague, made the waters pure again, but that they were unable to do. They could only increase the problem. That's what happens today. Some people will tell you, I know somebody somewhere. I know a man somewhere. No, there's nobody that can remove the judgment of God from a sinner. That can remove the sickness or the plague and the wrath of God from the offender. All they can do is to increase the problem that people have. Pharaoh's heart was not touched by the suffering of the people. That shows you his wickedness. Even though he saw that for seven days, for one whole week, the people did not have any, any good water to drink. They had to labor and be digging before they could drink. All the suffering of the people could not touch his heart. That's what happens today. The people that want to have their ways by, uh, they want to have their way by all means. Maybe a leader in a nation. Maybe a leader in a society. Maybe a leader in a community. Maybe a leader in a family. Maybe a leader in a denomination. He still will not care that the judgment of God will fall upon the people and they will suffer eternally. Because he wants to have his own way. At the end of the week, the plague was lifted, but others will still come. Let's learn a lesson before we pray. You see, we've learned a lot of things today. Events as well as words are teachers. Words direct words from God we can learn from. Also, we can learn from events that take place. And we've learned from a, a lot of events that took place in the study of today. We learn from this event that all the elements of nature are under God's control. He can do with every one of them just as he pleases. That shows us God is all powerful. When God's mercy and love and warning has failed to accomplish his purpose in man, he sends judgment. He can turn our glory into shame like he turned the water into blood. He can change a scene of life into death like he changed the water into blood. He can change useful things into useless like he changed the water into blood. He can change beautiful things. When we begin to worship those things into loathsome, you begin to worship your beauty, begin to worship your flesh, Begin to worship your personality. You begin to worship anything you have, like the children of Egypt worshipped River Nile. You can change those things to become no more beautiful but ugly and loathsome. All life depends on the will of God. My prayer is we will listen at all times to the truth that is taught by the word of God and taught by the events of scripture. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. He has revealed many things to us today. We have learned many things today. Let us bring everything, re re recall everything, and bring everything to the Lord in prayer. Are you hardening your heart? Are you rejecting the voice of him that is speaking to you? Are you driving the Holy Spirit away that is convicting you of your evil way? Repent if you have not repented. Be born again if you have not been born again. While the Lord is calling, come today, come today. Do not delay your day of salvation. Because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. If you are a child of God, are you declaring the total word of God? And are you, are you responding to the word of God? Or are you like those disciples and like those in Hebrews chapter 3? Are you hardening your heart? Are you hardening your neck? 
Have you been often corrected by the servants of God, by the leaders, the preachers of the word of God? And are you constantly, consistently rejecting the truth of the word of God? Remember, he that is often being reproved that had net his neck will perish and that without remedy. 